Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. I love the place here. I'm only here for about uh, two hours, but I definitely will go to the seaside uh, either today or tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the wonderful weather. Everything is absolutely fantastic here. And uh, thank you very much for the introduction. My current job is a kind of combination between a diplomat at the moment and a judge. Uh, maybe at the moment even a bit more diplomat than a, and than a judge. Okay, we, but we get to the UPC a little later, so uh, let me kick off with uh, patent law and its limits. And this, uh, the idea of this uh, talk is essentially to make you aware about a few basic aspects of patent law uh, and uh, uh, give you an overview what patent law is all about, but also talk about the limits of uh, patent protection. And unlike uh, the previous talk, I will start in the past, not in the future. So we are on quite safe grounds now. And have a look at, uh, at uh, uh, the first uh, um, occasions when uh, uh, patent law uh, was uh, um, set up. And what, is, uh, what are the aspects of patent law? So different characteristics. And one is, of course, the disclosure aspect, which already uh, comes from the word patent because it originates in the patent, uh, Latin word patere, which means to lay open. So that's one important aspect of a patent, to disclose uh, uh, an invention. Second, of course, is exclusivity. Patent was a shortened version of letters patent which was a royal decree granting exclusive right to a person. And that, of course, is also uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, essential aspects of, of a patent. And then, of course, it is technology related. And the first uh, 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 piece of law uh, was the Venetian patent statute, which uh, is from, uh, was from 1474, so uh, roughly, uh, 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 700 years, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 600 years ago, a little less. And, uh, and of course, also the statute of monopolies uh, in the UK, in England. And then another aspect is the limited term. Already in Venice, it was a, a patent for 10 years, and uh, under the statute of monopolies, it was 14 years. Now it is uh, uh, 20 years. Okay, let's have a uh, go on in history and have a look at uh, some uh, uh, general uh, pieces of legislature. And uh, uh, a very important one is, of course, the U.S. Constitution. And as you can see in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution from 1788, it says, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time, again, limited time, uh, authors and inventors to exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. Well, normally it should be translated into in inventions. It's not only discoveries. Um, <clears throat> and when we go on, uh, another uh, uh, cornerstone, uh, of course, is uh, the TRIPS agreement. And there it is said, the patent shall confer to, on its owner the following exclusive rights, and then again also, the term of protection shall not end before the expiration of a period of 20 years. There you have the 20 years, which you now can uh, find in almost all uh, patent acts around the world. And then finally, let's have a look at uh, EU uh, law and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And in Article 17, it laid down that property is protected in the EU, and then it is uh, specified in uh, paragraph two of that uh, article that intellectual property shall be protected. So it's expressly oh, IP is protected by the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So now, having this all in mind, what is the deal between the inventor and the state that grants a patent? So the deal. Essentially, it is on the one hand, the inventor makes an invention and, also very important, discloses it to the public. And on the other hand, the patent confers on the inventor, patent owner, the right to exclude others from making use of the invention. 
for a limited time. And how it, is it made sure that disclosure of uh, uh, the invention, so that it's really an invention on the one hand, and that on the other hand, it is also disclosed the invention. Well, this is done in the granting process, so in prosecution when the patent is granted, uh, where the examiner takes care of these aspects. But even if the examiner, for whatever reason, in the eyes of a third person got it wrong, so a patent was granted, but a third person thinks, no, it is not an invention, no, it doesn't disclose the invention, then that person can uh, file a revocation action, well, opposition uh, before the uh, European Patent Office, but also revocation uh, action before respective national courts. And uh, so it, by this, it, it made sure that these aspects really are a uh, matter. And, and in practice, of course, uh, the challenges under uh, the, uh, uh, the um, so-called patentability uh, uh, requirements so that uh, the invention is new, that it involves an inventive step, and uh, is susceptible of industrial uh, application comes from competitors on the market. The standard situation is a competitor is sued for patent infringement and then as a, 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 uh, as a uh, reply, uh, the, um, uh, the defendant attacks the patent and says, okay, the patent is not new, it is not based on an inventive step. And so it is made sure by this uh, mechanism that uh, really only real inventions are protected. And the same is true also that the patent shall disclose the patent. So it sh uh, when a person skilled in the art, it is not anybody. So it is not uh, uh, me and probably also not you who shall be able to carry out the invention after having read the patent. But the person skilled in the art, after having read the patent, shall be able to carry it out. So that's uh, the, uh, the aspect of uh, disclosure. And then a third aspect also matters uh, that uh, the patent, what is later uh, has been uh, granted as a patent, shall not go beyond what has been applied in first place, at first place. So that uh, is uh, the, the, uh, another reason for uh, uh, ground for revocation uh, that is a uh, uh, so-called added matter aspect. So these are already some uh, safeguards that only inventions are protected, that inventions are disclosed to the public, and that only is, uh, that is protected but that uh, has a basis already in the first application submitted to the patent office. And on the other hand, uh, f uh, so f uh, from the point of view of the, the patent owner, he or she can uh, enforce the patent during that limited time. And uh, uh, on the one uh, hand, of course, with regard to injunctive relief. So it is an exclusive right. And anybody who, without the consent of the patent owner, makes use of it, can stop that person from doing so. That's uh, uh, done by injunctive relief. So for the future, stop any further uh, infringement. But also for the past, since you cannot get it undone, but you get damage for, uh, for uh, infringements in the past. So that's, these are the benefits uh, for the patent owner for having made an invention and having disclosed it. Now this is the, the essential deal. However, there are many more limitations. And I'd like to, to briefly uh, uh, present them, at least some of them, to you. And we have to distinguish between different limitations. One limitation concerns the subject matter of a patent. So certain aspects of technology are not patentable. So you will not get a patent for that. Then you may have a patent, but certain actions uh, from third persons still are not considered to be a patent infringement. And then defenses come in. So let's start with what is a patentable subject matter. Of course, it has to be technology related. That uh, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to explore this in, uh, in one example a later, yeah. So one, of course, aspect at the beginning is the order uh, public, uh, order public or public order aspect or morality. Of course, that's a very broad uh, topic, but it has also been the subject of uh, uh, cases. 
For example, uh, uh, the case that was brought to the European Court of Justice, the Greenpeace Bristol case, which was about whether stem cells of uh, a blastocyte, blastocyte is a very early state of an embryo, can be protected by a patent or not. The basis for this uh, is, of course, uh, the, uh, the directive on the protection of biotechnical uh, inventions. And the answer of the European Court of Justice was generally not. Um, so to, 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 to uh, be precise, so it, is, was it was not about uh, the question whether you would uh, be allowed to take stem cells from a blastocyte. That's a, a different thing. It was only about the question whether you can pro uh, pro uh, get patent protection for uh, such a, a procedure. Um, another uh, uh, other exemption from patentability are plant and animal varieties, of course the human body, uh, and, uh, and then it's, a, it's another uh, field of discussion, uh, programs for uh, computers, so software. Software as such is not patentable in Europe, however, we very often find claims that contain software elements and contain other technical elements. So how to deal with these kind of mixed uh, uh, um, claims? And there, uh, uh, by the EPO, by the Boards of Appeal, the so-called convict uh, um, approach has been developed. So you look only at the technical ex uh, aspects when you decide on the question whether it is an invention or not while you look at all elements when you uh, has to have to decide whether there is infringement or not. So most uh, times it goes to the detriment of the patent owner, but still the patent owner can get uh, uh, protection when the, the, uh, the technical uh, as, uh, aspects qualify uh, the claim as uh, an invention. Okay, so far to uh, uh, the subject matter, the patentable subject matter. So there are already limitations. So it's a lot of things that are uh, uh, technology related still cannot be uh, patented as mentioned. Now let's uh, have a look at certain acts. So what uh, the alleged infringer or the user of the patent teaching is doing. Uh, what you can do without uh, 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 having to qualify what you are doing as a patent infringement. And of course, one uh, which uh, uh, is important for each of us is when you use uh, um, a, a patent infringing uh, product for non-commercial purposes, it is not patent infringing, only for uh, commercial purposes. Another aspect is uh, uh, the, the BOLA exemption. That's uh, very important in the pharmaceutical area. As you know, uh, uh, pharma, uh, um, when you have a, 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 a a pharmaceutical product protected by a patent claim, uh, and, and you get the protection, the patent is granted, you still normally cannot use it. Because in, uh, on top of this, you need a market authorization for making use of the medicament. Um, and um, uh, and uh, uh, so when the, the patent is used and the market authorization is uh, with, a, with a, a patent owner, then of course, competitors prepare for the time when the patent has been expired. And they also need the market authorization. And for that purpose, they have to make clinical trials very often. So clinical, doing clinical trials, it's a commercial, it's a, it's a purpose, normally would qualify to be a patent infringement. But under the BOLA exception, it is not considered to be a, a patent infringement if you do these uh, trials in order to get the market authorization. So what you can see on the market very often is once the patent has been expired, and sometimes you have extra protection under the uh, uh, under SPCs, as already mentioned uh, this morning, um, um, then uh, uh, one from one day to the other, the, the medicament gets much cheaper because uh, uh, competitors on the market, generic companies, already uh, got uh, the, uh, the market authorization to bring it on the market, and so they can do it just the day after expiration of, of the patent. So that's a, uh, another important uh, uh, um, limitation of the effects of a patent in practice. And uh, also uh, interesting in, uh, uh, extemporaneous preparation 
by a pharmacy. So when the pharmacy is preparing something, uh, 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 a medicament, uh, it, it can also be considered to be not uh, non-patent infringing. Now let's turn to, uh, uh, go a bit further, uh, let's turn to what kind of defenses or extra, uh, um, um, uh, well, um, justifications for using a patent so that the, at the end it is not considered to be a patent infringement. Uh, and, uh, and what is, of course, important in that context uh, are compulsory licenses. Compulsory licenses are granted in Europe, not on the EU level, but on the national level. So in, uh, uh, in, in Latvia, uh, it is, uh, I don't know exactly who, uh, who is going to uh, deal with this. In, in some countries, it is an authority. It can be the ministry. In, some other, in other countries, it's, it's a court who uh, grants uh, a compulsory license. In Germany, it's a court. Uh, so, um, and, uh, and, and most of the time, the requirement for, for granting a compulsory license is the public interest. There has to be a public interest uh, that uh, uh, the compulsory license is granted. And what kind of situation is this? Uh, so, uh, there is a, a, a decision from the German Federal Supreme Court um, um, which is a typical situation for granting uh, uh, a compulsory license, that is when a medicament for the treatment of serious disease has therapeutic properties that the medicaments available on the market do not have. Or uh, do not have this, uh, to the same extent, or when it is uh, its use avoids undesirable side effects that must be accepted when the other therapeutic agents are administered. So it is either uh, on, on the uh, um, on the therapeutic properties that are unique uh, of, uh, of the product for which uh, 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 a license, uh, uh, a compulsory license shall be granted or uh, certain side effects are avoided. And in the uh, case of Raticaravir, such a li uh, uh, compulsory license was granted on a provisional uh, basis uh, because it has uh, had a uh, 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 particular therapeutic uh, properties with regards to certain groups of patients uh, 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 in an antiviral therapy of HIV. Later the patent was uh, uh, revoked anyway by the European Patent Office, so it never came to, to a case on the merits in that uh, situation. But uh, this is a, a famous case, exception case, where uh, a compulsory license has been granted. Um, <coughs> just to, to mention, uh, there uh, is a plan uh, uh, by the uh, European Commission uh, to have a compulsory license also on the EU basis after the experience that were made in the COVID uh, time, uh, but only for a uh, compulsory license for crisis management. So it should be really a crisis like the COVID situation, not in general. Now let's turn to uh, uh, a further ex uh, aspect that is uh, very much under discussion at the moment, that is injunction and proportionality. Um, and uh, let me mention first in that context Article uh, um, uh, 3 of the Enforcement Directive. The uh, Enforcement Directive was also mentioned uh, already earlier this morning. Uh, and. Uh, it uh, provides that measures, procedures, and remedies shall be fair and equitable, effective, and that it is proportionate and dissuasive to be applied in such a manner as to, provo uh, as to avoid the creation of barriers to a legitimate trade and to provide for safeguards against their abuse. So you have the word proportionate there. Uh, when the uh, enforcement directive came into place, um, Roughly, uh, in, uh, it has to be, had to be implemented. There was a certain uh, 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 time provided for this, so roughly in, uh, in, in around 2009. That this provision had uh, almost no uh, effect in the first case law uh, that uh, was issued. But uh, after uh, a decision, uh, actually from the US Supreme Court, the eBay decision, uh, uh, which uh, provided that not automatically, when the court found that there is a patent infringement, uh, uh, an uh, injunction shall be issued, 
but one should look at the, uh, at the particular uh, requirement of the case. Then also a discussion in Europe uh, started. Uh, should, when, once the court found there is a patent infringement, should there always be injunctive relief? Or sh uh, should the, the court also take into consideration other aspects like the proportionality aspect? And uh, this, uh, in, uh, in, in parallel, there was also a case, case law from the European Court of Justice, uh, uh, the Promusike uh, uh, case law, which is the first decision, but then we, you have a lot of follow-up decisions, the European Court of Justice, in which the European Court of Justice said, well, when uh, implementing the measures, uh, the court, of course, shall interpret the national law in line with the directive, but not only that, uh, the court should al also uh, uh, take into consideration general principles <coughs> of the community and legal order, uh, and such as the principle of proportionality. And there you have the proportionality principle as well. Now, the Promusiki case, like all the other cases from the European Court of Justice on proportionality requirement, are cases in the trademark field, in the copyright field. There is no case in the patent field. The only case uh, you can find uh, from, uh, uh, is, is on a national basis, and the only case you can find from a Supreme Court of a, uh, of a member state of the EU is uh, the heat exchanger case from the German Supreme Court. And in that case, uh, the court tries to, to implement, to, to boil down on patent law what the proportionality requirements means with regard to injunctive relief. And, um, and uh, that's a, um, um, that's a, uh, well, what you have to understand is, as I mentioned, the, the patent gives an exclusive right. So that's the principle. So the patent owner, when it is an invention, it has been disclosed, uh, the invention, et cetera, et cetera, the, the patent owner is entitled to uh, a protection for a limited uh, time. End of uh, the injunction is the way how to enforce this. When uh, uh, a competitor makes, infringes the patent, then the competitor uh, goes to the court and the court finds, okay, there is an infringement, the patent is valid, so uh, we issue an injunction and the infringer has to stop uh, 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 continuing uh, with the infringement. That's a normal situation. That very often uh, uh, in, uh, includes a lot of hardship to uh, the infringer. The infringer made a lot of investment for having the capacity to produce the infringing product. Uh, he or she may lose uh, parts of the market uh, and has to develop a new uh, product. So uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, disadvantages, uh, uh, a lot of hardship for the uh, infringer, but this is because he or she infringed the patent. So that is the normal situation. Uh, so it would not uh, be an issue of proportionality because that's wanted under the enforcement directive. You just go back to the enforcement directive it tells you that measures, injunction is a measure, uh, shall be also effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. So only uh, in that regard it is effective and dissuasive when once the court found there's infringement, normally uh, an uh, injunction follows. So what, in what situation is, is it disproportionate? Uh, so no, this way. It is when an extra hardship comes on top of the normal hardship. That can make the situation uh, um, disproportionate. So the normal hardships that come with, uh, with an uh, injunction uh, uh, sh shall uh, be considered to not be disproportionate, uh, while, uh, and these hardships are justified by the infringement of the exclusive patent right, however, hardships resulting from the enforcement of an injunction in a patent infringement case that due to the special circumstances of the case go beyond these regular hardships may not be disproportionate. Okay, what, what situation is this? When you look into uh, the case law and into uh, um, 
articles uh, from, uh, from law professors in that regard, generally four situations are identified. One situation is uh, that the availability of the patented invention is in the interest of the public, so of third parties. Another situation could be that the patent protects a small component of a complex product and or the economic existence of the implementer is at risk. So complex product, smartphone, for example. But I, come, uh, I will uh, uh, go a bit more into details with these four situations uh, in a second. For a third situation that is discussed is the patent proprietor is a non-practicing entity. So meaning the patent proprietor is not directly making use of the patent, only wants to license the patent. And the fourth situation is the patent is a standard essential patent. That is the situation of an overlap between the patent law and, um, and competition law. So let's first address the first situation, and that is essentially the situation I already uh, presented to you uh, uh, with regard to uh, um, compulsory licenses. Uh, there's another case uh, decided in the UK uh, uh, by the uh, uh, High Court of England and Wales, uh, and uh, this was about a particular hard wolf. So the hard wolf was found to be patent infringing. But at the same uh, time, it was clear there was no alternative hard wolf uh, available for, uh, for surgeons to implement for a certain group of patients. So a certain group of patients would, wouldn't get the best hard wolf for their, uh, for, for their needs if uh, a surgeon would implement another a hard wolf that was available in the market. However, there was an alternative hard wolf, so not yet uh, used by the surgeons, that was available. So it would took time for the surgeons to get on training how to implement this alternative hard wolf. And uh, the court found, okay, it might take 12 months for, for the surgeons to, to uh, be trained to implement the hard wolf. The, the alternative one. And so the court issued a decision in which uh, it said, okay, now for the next 12 months, even though it is a patent infringement, uh, 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 the uh, infringer still can sell the product to the benefit of this particular group of patients because surgeons can only implement this hard wolf according to their needs. And after 12 months, the, the, uh, the surgeons are tr very well trained in the in the, in the replacement hard wolf, and then uh, uh, the injunction uh, comes into effect, and uh, the um, and the uh, uh, and, and then uh, the surgeon gives the, the alternative one. So that is a typical situation for such a. Um, so you see the extra hardship. This is not the normal hardship uh, for injunctive relief that normally comes with an injunction, but is the extra hardship of these patients that makes uh, makes the difference. Uh, another situation that is discussed is when you have a complex product. So it is a typical thing with a, with a smartphone. In the smartphone, thousands of patents may be involved. Now, let's assume one minor functionality is patented, uh, and, um, and this is infringed, yes. But normally it takes uh, some time to get this function, this patent infringement, replaced by another. Uh, um, uh, by an alternative way to, to solve the, uh, the particular uh, problem, the function, or by uh, or simply by getting a license or um, or well, model around somewhere. So uh, when this is the case, it is discussed whether uh, uh, this is also qualifies as a situation where the proportionality aspect comes to place, and this is based and now. Uh, I'm back to, to the eBay uh, Merck uh, decision from the UK, uh, sorry, from the US Supreme Court, uh, and it was uh, the Justice Kennedy from from that court who uh, uh, put into uh, uh, from whom is uh, uh, you have this uh, citation when the patent invention is but a small component of the products the companies seek uh, to uh, produce, and the threat of an injunction is employed simply for undue leverage in negotiations. Legal damage may be well be sufficient to compensate for the infringement and injunction may not serve the interest of the public. 
uh, European courts would not go that far. They would be m much more uh, uh, reluctant. However, uh, there's still the decision from the German uh, uh, Supreme Court <laughs> who uh, somehow narrows it down uh, uh, with regard to the, uh, to the enforcement directive. And there the case was a different one. It was a, a case of, uh, about a convertible car. So these fancy cars you can use in the summer, but some people also want to use this in the spring and in, the, uh, in, um, in autumn. And uh, uh, okay, then it's a bit uh, uh, colder and uh, you want to uh, protect uh, your uh, uh, throat uh, and, and you, of course you may use a scarf, a classical scarf and that's fine. But some people think that's not that fancy. So uh, for them, uh, the car maker provided a so-called air scarf, which was a kind of heating, push, uh, getting hot uh, air to your neck while you are in the convertible car. So not very eco, uh, uh, not a really eco thing, uh, but uh, it was uh, offered. And, uh, and the court, uh, the Federal Supreme Court found, yes, there is a pattern infringement. But uh, uh, the case was uh, such as uh, the pattern would, ex would have expired uh, eight months later after the decision. So the car maker wanted uh, to uh, persuade uh, the court uh, that uh, um, it is disproportionate to issue the injunction only for the, uh, for the remaining eight months of uh, the lifetime of that patent. And, uh, and so the, the uh, court did a test. Uh, applying what I, uh, in general, explained to you with the general hardship and this, uh, the, the uh, extra hardship that comes on top that only justifies the, the proportionality, the disproportionality uh, uh, defense. And here uh, they checked three elements. They first said the infringing heating system, so the air scarf, did not affect the general usability of the convertible car. Of course, it did not. You can use, if the uh, air scarf is uh, no longer uh, functional, you still can use your convertible car, no problem. You, you can travel wherever you want to with your uh, nice car. Second aspect, it has not been shown that the defendant, uh, that they could not obtain a license on a reasonable terms. So they did not even try to get a license. And third aspect, there were no indications of a serious and disproportionate impact on the defense economic existence. So one of the big car makers uh, that uh, easily could survive without this uh, aspect. But of course, they had to pay a lot uh, uh, as a result, as at least uh, what I was told for that. So in the end, uh, it was not to considered to be disproportionate to issue the injunction only for the uh, remaining uh, eight months' time. Uh, I come to the third aspect, non-practicing entity. That aspect uh, plays quite a role in, uh, uh, in the case law in the U.S., but it does not in Europe. At least to my knowledge, I don't know any case in which this was an important aspect. I will not exclude that this could be one aspect to be considered in a, in a general uh, context, uh, but if it's only that, it would mean you discriminate patent owner that make use of the patent only by licensing, and it is hard to find a basis for this, because it is one way to use a patent. If you don't use it yourself, you just license it. Um, so this is uh, discussed, but as I said, there is no case law in Europe at the moment. And now finally, do I still have some time to, uh, five minutes? Okay, five minutes. Uh, I will be finished in five minutes. Um, so uh, the last uh, uh, of these four points is the overlap between patent law and competition law. And uh, in that context, there's a very, very important uh, decision of, uh, uh, by the European Court of Justice uh, in the case Huawei City. Interestingly, both Chinese companies. Um, and, uh, and there, uh, the Court of Justice laid uh, down uh, some important principles and also a kind of procedure how to deal with this situation. Some call it uh, the SAP dance. Uh, I, I will, uh, you will uh, learn uh, why in a second. So the first point is the exercise of an exclusive right by bringing in action for infringement and seeking injunction as such does not constitute an abuse of a dominant position. You always have to check in competition law's dominant position, otherwise competition law is out. So having uh, the exercise of an exclusive right, including of course a patent as such, going to a court, asking for, uh, for, uh, 
for injunctive relief because an infringement as such is not an infringement of competition law. Before that decision, sometimes looking what the commission published and said, you could have doubt whether this was uh, at least for everyone in the commission uh, uh, true. But now it is uh, clearly set by the European Court of Justice. However, the second sentence, the exercise of an exclusive uh, uh, a right linked to a, a patent may, in exceptional circumstances, involve the abuse of a dominant position under competition law. So again, you have to look uh, for, an exceptional, uh, for exceptional circumstances. And, uh, and then now to explain what a, a, a standard essential patent is, where this all comes into play, a standard essential patent is a patent that relates to a standard. So when you want to make use of a standard, you automatically uh, also make use of the patent. And therefore, if you have no, uh, no, no consent, infringe the patent. So for example, again, the smartphone, in order to, uh, to <coughs> allow the communication of the smartphones, we have certain standards, like the uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. And only when your uh, 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 smartphone complies to the standard, you can communicate. So anyone who wants uh, to get on the market for smartphones has to comply to this standard. Now, when the standard is set up, uh, they, they look for uh, certain functionalities. And sometimes these functionalities are uh, protected by a patent. Because, uh, of course, they, it, uh, uh, who first uh, developed the idea want to have it protected for him or herself. So uh, the situation is, well, you make use of the standard, but at the same time, you make use of a particular uh, patent. That's a, a standard essential patent. And you see the overlap. On the one hand, you have the patent protection. On the other hand, access to the market is a dominant position, of course. When you have a patent that is part of, the, of such a standard, uh, you, uh, anyone who wants to, to use it, has to, uh, to, to get on the market, has to use your patent. Okay, now, how to deal with this situation? Uh, <clears throat> so unlike the normal situation, when, when you uh, infringe a patent, uh, um, you, uh, sorry, when you uh, want to use the patent, you normally should go to the, to the uh, patent owner and ask the patent owner, please give me a license. And then the patent owner can say yes or no. Uh, in this situation, um, implementers, so people who make use of, uh, of uh, standard essential patent, may go on the market. It is still okay. But when then the uh, standard essential uh, patent owner uh, holder gets aware of the situation, okay, then one of the competitor is, is uh, uh, selling uh, smartphones, making use of the standard where I have a uh, standard essential patent, then the SCP holder on the uh, uh, Huawei CTE has first to, to, to write a letter to that competitor and tell him, okay, that patent according to my understanding, uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, your product, according to my understanding, makes use of my patent. So designate the patent that is uh, uh, involved and specify the infringement. And uh, that can, can be done, for example, by claim charts. You, you split up the, the patent claim by, uh, I don't know, the patent claim has five elements, and you have element one. Uh, you you uh, have the element one on the left side of the chart, on the right side, you say, okay, this element makes use of, uh, sorry, this part of your uh, allegedly infringing product makes use of that element. And then you, that, that can be done this way, but not necessarily. And then, and that's now the, the dance. It was the first step by the SCP uh, holder. Then the implementer has to respond. They should not wait two years for that. They have to respond quickly and they have to express willingness to take a friend license. So there were cases where they said, okay, uh, after one year, well, we contemplating, uh, we, maybe we, we, uh, we contemplating, we, we consider to take a license. No, that's not good enough. You have to take a license, uh, you have to say, okay, we are willing to take a license. Then uh, the next step, again, it's now for the SEP holder. They have to uh, come up with a specific offer for a license, for granting a license. So with everything that is normally in the license uh, agreement as an offer. So in particular, the amount of royalties, 
and the way it is to be uh, calculated. Th these are at least the two aspects that were mentioned by the European Court of Justice. And then the next step for the implementer is, okay, I take a license, I take a license under these conditions, very often it is not like this, uh, or alternatively, submit a counter offer. So say, okay, we are, uh, we are willing, but under these conditions. So rather than uh, royalties, I don't know, 1% of the product, we only want to pay 0.1% of the product. And, uh, and then they have to continue the negotiation to be willing on both sides. Willing to grant the license, to consider to be willing to grant the license, and to be considered to be willing to take a license. When the court, at least that's German practice, when the court comes to the uh, uh, conclusion that uh, the, uh, the, the implementer is not willing to take a license, then they will issue injunctive relief. When they consider, they come to the conclusion that the patent owner is not willing to, uh, to grant a license, they will uh, reject the request for injunctive relief. So that's uh, outlining. It's very complex when we go into detail on, on this. But before uh, uh, we uh, end, these are locations of uh, the UPC, court buildings of the UPC. Uh, I very often like to make a little test, but you know where these uh, buildings are. So do you have an idea where the first building on the first row is? First line? Yeah. Who said Stockholm? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. And that's actually your regional division. That's the regional division not only of, of Sweden, but also of the three Baltic states. Uh, alternatively, there are also locations in, uh, in the capitals of the three Baltic states, but that's the main place for, for the court building. It's like an old castle, but it's not that old. It's from the 19th century. Uh, so the next building, you know where this is? You do a little tour around Europe now. <coughs> no, it's Vienna. In Vienna. And the next one? <laughs> no, Germany is so correct, but not Munich. Yeah. <coughs> the Düsseldorf, yes, right, Düsseldorf. And then the uh, second uh, line, first one. Sorry? No? Paris, yes, it's Paris. But it is actually in that building, uh, they have a courtroom where they can have hearings of the UPC, but the photo is taken from the office. Uh, so it is not the building itself, it's taken from the office uh, to the, so and this is Ile de Seine. So it's very, really in the middle of Paris. And the next one, that's Luxembourg, exactly. That is a former building of the, uh, of the European Parliament. And the final one? Yes, Italy, you're right, Milano. That's Milano, thank you very much.